Hi, everyone, and welcome to our last Human Rights in Practice series event of the semester, Ireland's Referendum Appealing the Abortion Ban, presented by the International Human Rights Clinic and the Center for International and Comparative Law. Our event is also co-sponsored by the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute, the Duke Human Rights Center at the Keenan Institute for Ethics, the Human Rights Law Society, and the International Law Society. And our event today is also part of Duke at Home in the World, which is a month-long program of the Duke University Office of Global Affairs. Before forgetting, we have a special request from our photographer. Um, when you finish eating, if you could try to surreptitiously put your plates underneath the table so they don't <laughs> pay a, play a prominent role in the photos, that would be great. <laughs> Um, our two speakers today, who I'm very happy to introduce, are Ashling Reedy and Christine Ryan. Ashling has served as Senior Legal Advisor at Human Rights Watch since 2006, focusing on Europe and Central Asia, the Americas, and several African states. Previously, Reedy, who is an Irish barrister, was the director of the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. She also worked in The Hague as a trial lawyer in the Office of the Prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Ashling has litigated multiple cases before the European Court of Human Rights and has appeared on behalf of Turkey, Turkey's Kurdish victims of rights violations. After the Kosovo War, she worked there as Senior Human Rights Analyst for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, where she worked with families of the disappeared as the head of a victim identification and recovery program. Ashling has also taught international humanitarian law and human rights law at the university level. Christine Ryan is a final year doctoral student at Duke Law and the Duke Global Health Institute. Her research focuses on feminist and human rights based approaches to abortion access. She's done field work in Ireland, Geneva, and Kenya to analyze the role of human rights in abortion politics. And prior to Duke, Christine worked as a human rights officer with the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, focusing on business and human rights, women's rights, and the protection of civil space. By way of a very brief introduction, on May 25th of this year, a landslide majority of 66.4% of the Irish population voted to repeal the Eighth Amendment to the Irish Constitution to remove Ireland's abortion ban. Ashling will start us off by speaking on the background and history of laws with respect to abortion in Ireland, as well as litigation efforts at both the regional and international levels over the years in attempts to liberalize the abortion law in Ireland. She'll also share some comparative examples from other countries in terms of abortion laws and advocacy. And Christine will then speak about efforts around the referendum and how movements in Ireland used international human rights to influence domestic actors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ian. Thank you for the, uh, for the invitation to, to come and speak. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I'm going to say what I always say is that I have a tendency to speak very quickly. It goes even more in that direction when I'm not reading from a prepared script. So I will try to look out for a glazy over eyes and suggest that you've lost me. But if I really end up speaking uh, too fast, please just you know wave at me or do something to catch my attention. Um, I won't be insulted. Um, I'd probably be more insulted if I thought Let's let her finish, and uh, <laughs> the quicker she goes, the more, the, the sooner we're over this. So, uh, so do let me know if uh, uh, if I fall into bad habits. Um, I was having a quick talk with um, with Christine before this, here, and I, I really think, I mean, I think Christine is some of the most interesting and, and of course, most recent um, work that she's done on looking at the referendum, which which just happened um, this year. And I, frankly, for one, I'm, I'm very interested to hear what she has to say. Um, but since I'm here and we were discussing this generation gap, <laughs> I am going to really reflect and look back um, at you know when I guess w how you know the abortion debate in Ireland developed a little bit in, in parallel with developments on the global um, uh, on the global scale um, and uh, and see you know where we got to today. So I know I don't there won't be a pop quiz. I don't expect you all to know the history of abortion law in Ireland. Um, by the, end of, by the end of today's chat, but, um, but let me try to set a bit of context for, for the research that, uh, that Christine then carried out this, this year. Um, abortion until, I don't 
in its bluntest form. So abortion was never legal in Ireland. It was always a, a criminal offence. Ireland, as you may know, is a very deeply Catholic country, and I'm just going to kind of come back to that. It was a offence which, um, for most of the time, under an 1861 law, was actually punishable um, by life in prison and penal servitude. Um, for uh, for trying to procure uh, or carry out a, an abortion, and then slightly lesser penalties for those that might in some way um, aid and abet or, or, or assist. But what happened, um, and really this is a reaction to what was happening in the UK, in England across the water, um, but also here in the States uh, with Rowan Wade, that um, conservative forces in Ireland began to con get concerned that there could be a court decision like Roe and Wade here in the US, and suddenly, um, that the, uh, the laws in Ireland could change and there could be uh, abortion could be permitted in Ireland. So they got uh, a movement together to actually introduce in 1983 a, um, a provision to the Constitution that would prohibit, essentially prohibit abortions. And um, that amendment passed in 1983 um, was successful and became what's known as, as the Eighth Amendment to the Irish Constitution. And just as a background, the Irish Constitution can only be changed by way of referendum. So that is, it had to be voted by the people in, and this May was voted, essentially struck from the Constitution, um, what are we going to, 25 years, 25 years later. Um, just so you know the, the, the kinds we're talking about, what the amendment introduced was uh, a provision that said that the state acknowledges the life, the right to life of the unborn. That became legally controversial, what is an unborn? With due regard to the equal right to the life of the mother, so it equated the fetus and the, the fetus to, to the woman or to the girl, and then guaranteed in its laws to respect, and as far as practical, and this became uh, another controversial issue, to defend and vindicate that right to life of, of the unborn. And that's where you see some of the, the, the cases that developed. So I mean, at the time, I'm gonna mention it, I, um, I mentioned that for a while, um, I was the director of an organization called the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, which is a small little version of the ACLU, kind of proportionate to Ireland's size, um, and was founded originally um, amongst them by Mary Robinson, who went on to be president of Ireland and, and uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights. At the time, Mary Robinson was a senator, or she was a barrister, um, and she warned that this provision you know, was going to cause a lot of trouble, that it was problematic, campaigned against it, um, and, and she, she lost. Well, what she predicted in terms of sort of cases that might come up to, to be tested came true. And I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to skip to a little bit ahead now to some of the controversial cases, but I just want to put that in context. I said this happened in 1984 in a very conservative Ireland. At the time, um, Ireland also in the constitution already had a ban on divorce, so there was no divorce. In 1986, so just two years after that referendum, they tried to repeal that ban on divorce and that repeal was rejected. So we didn't have divorce in Ireland until another decade later, until 1995. So you can imagine, it's a very conservative Catholic country. And it wasn't also alone. It was um, also within European countries um, like Poland, which of course was still part of the Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, that said, but again, a Catholic country. You had small areas like Andorra, Malta, which still have very restrictive laws. And of course, um, across um, Latin America, most of which, again, continues to have very, very restrictive laws. So the first, um, between then and now uh, in Ireland, so between the, the, the Eighth Amendment coming in and, and the repeal, Irish people were put, formal referendums happened involving six different questions, and most of them because of, of cases that happened. So the first case that happened, um, and I remember I was, uh, first sort of litigation, I was in university, and if you were uh, a, uh, if you were used to open a magazine that came across from the UK, you would see lots of pages that were just blanked out. And I don't know if any of you have studied, for example, uh, you know, apartheid uh, during the apartheid years, and you would see newspapers that just literally had blanked out. Well, in the Irish case, um, the anti-choice movement had been successful in getting a prohibition, an injunction from courts on any information available in Ireland at all about services available elsewhere to get abortion. So you would pick up a magazine and there'd be blank and it would say, by law we are not allowed to reprint these, uh, these advertisements in, in Ireland. Um, student Union, they went around to universities and they gave out leaflets about who you could call if you were in a crisis situation. They tried to put them in jail. And eventually this got litigated to the courts 
um, both at the European Union level, who said that Ireland couldn't prohibit information about services elsewhere, but also to the European Court of Human Rights level, who said that you couldn't interfere with right of access to information and to freedom of expression. So there were the, the first cases um, that, that happened. And then in 1992, um, I'm proud to say I was still in university at that time, um, I was right, the, the case called the X case, which I think began to transform things a little bit and what happened. And what, ha what happened in that case was there was a 13-year-old girl who had been uh, raped by a, not a family member, but I believe it was a, a next door neighbor. The family wanted to prosecute the uh, perpetrator and they went to the police and they said, oh, we're going to go to England and have an abortion. If we can, can we take evidence to prove that it was this person who impregnated our daughter? And the attorney general, because I said, oh, I'm not sure you're allowed to go to England uh, and have that abortion. And he sought and got from the courts an injunction to stop that 13-year-old girl with the support of her parents going to, uh, to England to have an abortion. So this got appealed up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court overturned the injunction and said that the, uh, the provision, which I talked about, says there's an equal right to life uh, of the mother, so that the mother's life should be saved. And that includes if the mother is suicidal because of the pregnancy. And that is basically how they cracked open the first opportunity to, to, to say that there was a right to abort in Ireland. Limited circumstances, right to life, including because of suicide. And in that case, then, the, the, um, the girl was allowed to travel, although what we understand is, in fact, the, the pregnancy ended in a miscarriage. But that came up again uh, a number of years later um, when a girl who was in care of the state uh, was raped, and again a, 14, a 13 or 14 year old, and they had to go to court to get the permission uh, from the state for her to travel um, abroad to get, um, uh, to, to get an, an abortion in, in the UK. So in 1992, the Irish people were asked three times, were asked three questions. One, do you want to protect the right to travel? One, do you want to protect the right to information? And do you want to overturn suicide as a ground for, um, for abortion? And the Irish public said, we protect the right to information, we protect the right to travel, and we also want to protect the right to suicide. We accept the court's decision, although conservative forces were trying to push back the, the court. Mm -hmm. I say that because that was, because 10 years later in 2002, I'm gonna say this, 63.5% of people, and you'll see maybe that reflects some of them, voted not to remove the ground of suicide. Ten years later, the, again, a government, despite public opinion, tried to overturn, remove suicide as a ground. And in that case, the Irish people rejected it. But by this, on this particular occasion, only by 50.4%. So less than 1% divided those. We could have lost the ground in 2002 um, that a suicidal pregnant girl or woman um, could not have could not access, access abortion. Um, so uh, I want to say, so while kind of this was going on and these domestic cases um, were happening, there were, I would say that the government, and I think I'll try to in indicate that by the fact that they sought uh, injunctions against people giving information, that they sought injunctions against teenage rape victims from traveling. Um, I think they, you know, they went out of their way to be particularly conservative, um, probably more so than I think the general population um, uh, warranted at the time in terms of um, what they, uh, you know, what, what the general support for access to abortion, particularly in difficult cases, was. But um, even after the, the reference that the government failed to put any legislation in place to regulate when you could get an abortion, even if your life was in danger, they refused to regulate access to information in terms of what I think you have here in the States as well. Uh, a lot of rogue agencies who set up and try to provide fake information about consequences of abortion, but also procedural issues. So you delay and delay um, a pregnancy so that it goes beyond a time limit in which it is possible safely to, to get a, uh, an abortion. Um, and, and also um, the information was very restricted. So if you went into a family planning clinic and you said, I want to go to uh, England or anywhere else to get uh, a termination for the following reasons, what can I do? They had to be so careful never to be encouraging you to get, uh, they could provide you with a, they literally have a piece of paper and provide you with the number you can do this. Anything that was taken as encouragement, um, they could be uh, committing a criminal offence. Um, so they went, um, as a, and, and this kind of, just so I'll say the, I used to be particularly, when I was in charge of the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, we would join with other groups, including particularly um, 
uh, women's rights groups to mark the eighth, the day that the eighth amendment came in, and note just how many thousands of women over the last year had travelled abroad to get abortions, um, and to call again for for a repeal. And those gatherings would routinely be broken up by very, very militant, um, particularly young youth defense groups who were anti-choice, who would come in and try to uh, break up the meetings, be very abusive to high-profile members of, of the uh, pro-choice uh, movement of that. So it was, um, uh, you know, quite a, it was, like in most places, very contentious and, and pretty militant in all of the time. And it's about this time, so from the mid 2000s to the last decade, when I think Irish groups really started turning to uh, international human rights framework to start making a change, because they figured the government is being so conservative, and yet here we have the Irish government, which likes to pride itself on being um, part of the international community. It signed up to all the relevant international instruments, so Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the European Convention on Human Rights, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, etc. And so more and more groups started making, bringing in the fact that the restrictive laws in Ireland were um, having these impact on women in terms of putting their health in danger, their life in danger, and then the discriminatory impact it would have on women who, for whatever reason, financially or otherwise, weren't able to, to access, to, to leave the country to, to get an abortion. Um, and one thing I'm just going to point out, because I know I want to leave enough time for, um, for Christine to give us the most recent stuff, um, is, uh, I guess, two quick things. I just wanted to look at the language that over the time, the, um, the human rights bodies who were talking, who uh, Ireland had to report to, um, and back in the beginning, like in, in 2000, in 2003, 4 and 5, you had language saying things that um, the Irish government should ensure that women are not forced to continue with unwanted pregnancies, and they expressed concern at the limited circumstances in which uh, legal abortions were possible. And they expressed concern that the Irish government had failed even to regulate when that right was, was possible. By the time we get up to... Um, 2015, 16, and 17, the same committees, that's the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the Committees against Elimination, on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, and the Human Rights Council, were much more blatant to, to the Irish government. They told them that they had to amend the Constitution, uh, which was impeding introduction of reform of the law. They said, hold a referendum if that's what you have to do. Um, and uh, even the, uh, the Committee Against Torture, which you may not think is an obvious body that would consider questions of access to, to uh, abortion, told uh, the Irish government in 2017 that at least they had to ensure provision of post-abortion health care for women, irrespective of how or whatever they, how, in what circumstances they had undergone um, uh, an abortion. So you did have at this governmental level, um, a lot, you know, intergovernmental level, a lot more pressure on, on the Irish government. Um, and you also had two cases in which they had found the Irish government had violated um, the rights of women who had to travel abroad. They, had, they said that the fact they had to go abroad, the Human Rights Committee said that the fact they had to go abroad to get an abortion put them in uh, inhumane and degrading circumstances and violated that prohibition on, on inhuman treatment. And crucially, the, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, while not finding that Ireland had to provide abortion, did find that in a case where a woman uh, who had to go to England um, to get an abortion because she was otherwise being denied life-saving cancer treatment in, in Ireland, um, that her right had been violated because she had no legal certainty in Ireland about how to get it. So all that pressure um, at, the, at the level, all of a sudden the Irish government every year uh, had to start telling you know, committees and the European Court and the Committee of Ministers what they were doing to, to change the law. And this then, at the same time, on the, on the grassroots level, and I'm going to leave this to Christine, happens at a time when there's a change, a shift in attitude in, in Ireland. And you see um, Amnesty International in particular, but newspapers in general, were doing a lot of polling uh, about asking what people thought about abortion in particular circumstances and then in general about the right to choose and, and access. And you could see a shift in, in change. And then we had, I mean, most recently, I'm going to say there were two recent events that for me, uh, you know, indicated where the change had, had come. One um, was the death, which I've heard of, of um, Savita, and I'm going to mangle her, her second name, Halpanar. Um, she was an Indian dentist living with her husband in Ireland. She was pregnant, they both wanted the baby, and then there arose complications with the baby. She went into the hospital and it became clear that she was going to miscarriage. 
The hospital refused to terminate the pregnancy because they said they didn't know if they could, and she died from ultimately a sepsis infection, but what could have been prevented had she been able to have that abortion. And that galvanized a feeling around Ireland of the fact that this woman, Savita, was in our country, uh, you know, happy with her family, looking forward to the birth of her child, and she had died because of our abortion laws. And up till then, we've been able to hide the kind of the sad stories of who had died or what had happened to people because people were going across the, bo the water to, to, uh, to England or to the Netherlands or elsewhere we, we could go. And this, I think, really, again, was a way of, of galvanizing it. The second thing I think that indicated change for me, and you may not see the exact connection, was the vote on marriage equality, uh, which happened uh, now three years, right? Three years mm -hmm. before uh, this referendum came up. And that was the first time, you know, Ireland grappled with a lot of, um, you know, on that level since the a divorce referendum in '95. So, like, 20 years later, um, what sort of country did we want to be? How did we see? And what was our relationship with the Catholic Church? And of course, a lot of young people voting for the first time. Maybe. <laughs> like, so, uh, you know, who hadn't been voting in previous who hadn't been voting in previous abortion referendums, and uh, you know, and that um, the way that the groups campaigned around marriage equality, the way people got involved in terms of talking about how it affected <coughs> families and people, and in particular women in Ireland, the fact that this was the first time that women in Ireland in a bay were throwing off, if you like, the control of the Catholic Church, saying, we have grown up being controlled by the Catholic Church. We were told we couldn't get divorced. You stay in your bad marriages. We were told you're not allowed to have access to contraception. We we're told that no matter when you, if your health is in danger, you are not allowed to have a termination. The, you know, and eventually, and then of course, at the same time, you had revelations of much of widespread clerical, clerical abuse. So that marriage equality referendum, you know, got people talking about rights and, and families and that in a different way. And I think women in particular came out to vote for what they thought was right. And I know from like, my own little network, and I know I live in a little liberal bubble, um, but you know, the minute that that referendum was won by people, and it was won by 64% uh, of the people to vote for marriage equality, um, the f on Facebook and everything, you know, you saw people flip from, you know, yes for equality, or together for yes, and then switch over to repeal the eighth. And that coalition of people who wanted to see a kind of modern uh, Ireland that was in respect for equality and human rights also saw that the repeal of the eighth amendment and lifting the ban on abortion was the obvious next step to trying to create a, a, a more uh, equal Ireland. Now, I know I haven't kind of compared that to what was happening in, say, Latin America at the same time and, and my thoughts about the future, but I have been speaking for about 15 minutes, so I want to give Christine the floor and a bit of a chance. Great. Um, thank you, Ashling. And I hope that you know you have. I think you have imparted to everybody just how devastating that history is around the abortion ban. And similarly, you know how Ashling phrased, you know, throwing off the control. I would describe it in the same way. You know, you were the country removed the sh these shackles that were on women. And you know, Ashling spoke to us a bit about how what was happening at the international level impacted the government and forced them to reckon with Ireland's reputation abroad and if we wanted to be seen as a country who was progressive and this you know Birmingham you know bright democracy a small little island that things were going to have to change in how they responded and so what I want to talk about a bit is how you know, what was happening in terms of that external pressure also generated huge internal pressure on the ground. So how it impacted the movement itself. So how this human rights advocacy at the international level, what it did for the organizers on the ground. And I, there's three main things that I can see. And one huge one was in terms of mobilization. Um, on the ground. And this is important when we think about regularly in terms of human rights campaigns, people describe them as, you know, almost supplanting community organizing and grassroots movements. But the opposite happened in Ireland. So we heard about there was this case at the European level that then resulted in finally legislation guaranteeing access to life saving abortion access. And it wasn't liberalizing the law, it was just telling the government, you have to regulate this and put something in place so that we don't end up with cases like Savita Help never again. And from that case and the, go, the need for parliament to actually address this, 
organizations grew up all around the country and they grew be coming out of the experience of advocating at the legislative level to then work um, with the organizations who had been you know progressing this international advocacy for a number of years and advocates when I first went to talk to them about this they really described how being able to refer to the international level and the human rights norms, how that created a space for dialogue and learning among rights holders and civil society that hadn't really existed because abortion had been so shrouded by secrecy and shame and stigma and how empowering that was. You know, one advocate, I remember her telling me how you know, important she felt that it was that you know, when we were all in national school, you were shown videos about the, the silent scream was the main one and it was just the horrors of abortion so this whole generation of people who had grown up being given that in school were now opening a newspaper and seeing that the committee against torture is describing what the is describing ireland's abortion ban as cruel and human degrading treatment and how important that was for the advocates themselves and they also now say that looking back and reflecting that this was trading for the advocates for what was to come. You know, there was this generation of new advocates who were getting experience engaging at the international level and talking about that at home and how that mattered when it came to finally getting a referendum. It also allowed for coalitions to build. So the very first international case that was taken was to, there was one Irish organization, the Irish Family Planning Association, who led this litigation, the ABC case, to the European Court of Human Rights. And after that, Amnesty International finally came on board. The, I, the National Women's Council, the Human Rights Commission, more and more trade unions came on board. And it was again this legitimizing impact that we can talk about this now as a human rights issue. And it also engaged out of group organizations who were, you know, the, the trade unions, migrant rights groups, because the case that had involved two of them had been migrants to the country and the impact on them of having to go abroad. And also it was a time of austerity in Ireland and people very much were advocates could see this in terms of the impact of Ireland's austerity measures on the ability of women to book flights, to travel abroad, to take time off work and what that meant. So that leads as well to the impact of the human rights advocacy on the message that was being used by the campaign. And every time these organizations were coming together and documenting what, how the abortion ban was violating women's rights, they were documenting and translating the harms that were happening to real women in Ireland and based upon their testimonies and experiences. So then when it came to the time for a referendum, there was a huge body of research that had been done that they were ready to go with and say, this is what's been happening to women. You're denying them access to healthcare. You're putting more and more barriers um, in front of people who are already marginalized in Irish society from asylum seekers to women living in poverty to women suffering you know, from addiction. And that was really important at a later stage. And you know, we mentioned um, the death of Savita Halpenaver as being hugely important for the country to come and reckon with this. And I think that looking back, you could think what could have happened at that point was the abortion rights movement could have become about we're going to try and get legislation that will provide clear access in cases of life, risk to health. Um, and where there's a fatal fetal anomaly. So the kind of this exceptions based framework that is used as a strategy in many countries to then hopefully get liberal access. But I think in part because a lot of the work that had been done was talking about the impacts of travel on women, on ordinary women, that the movement wasn't happy to just accept that we're going to try and run with that. They really advocated for free, safe, legal abortion in the country. And that ended up being very, very important because that's the type of legislation that we will now hopefully get, um, that we are getting, but there, as we'll say, there's a few glitches that need to be worked out. And um, I also wanted to say a little bit about, you know, my methodology in doing this research. So I first you know, was writing an essay here at Duke about, you know, the role of gender in the constitution and 
what I saw as different organizations in Ireland really challenging that and using the human rights framework and one Christmas break I just met with a couple of organizations and I came back and I was really encouraged by my dissertation committee which includes Professor Huckerby, Professor Helfer and Dean Bartlett to look at this at a deeper level and to really capture what was happening because I could see it as being momentous but to um, dig deeper. So the first summer 2016 I um, conducted interviews um, with advocates and I was fortunate that I had taken the human rights clinic here at Duke and had, had training in how to do interviews, how to do your research beforehand in terms of the document collection, um, analyzing campaign materials, legislative debates, and doing your legal analysis beforehand in working through how you ask questions and how you build trust with the people that you're interviewing. Because it was something that was really important because sometimes, you know, these advocates, they are the women who have suffered the ban. They were a lot of the people at the forefront of the campaign. And I found myself in situations where I could be sitting in someone's kitchen and they were telling me the, how they got involved in this work because the state had abandoned them at their time of need and that they were still suffering because of that. So it was really important that I had had you know, the experience here of how to really build trust and be very respectful in doing this type of work. And looking back, it's also really interesting thinking, you know, this was 2016 and we're now 2018 and it's this big celebration. But some of the actors who really came on board in terms of politicians um, in 2018 wouldn't talk to me in 2016 for love nor money. They just wouldn't engage at all. And there was a huge reticence even then for politicians and government ministers to talk about this. <coughs> and at that point, the anti-choice groups were also very willing to talk to me because they still saw the game as being quite open and to talk about what they were doing. And there were still some groups missing from the campaign. The, you know, the, the violence against women's groups still weren't convinced and trade unions. But then as time went on, you know, I kept tracking and it became a lot more open. So in February 2017, I went to Geneva. Um, Ireland was being examined by the CEDAW committee. And a lot of the organizations, as I said, they had worked together in a coalition to prepare um, submissions to the CEDAW committee. And I wanted to see how the government would talk at this point, um, how the committee interacted with the advocates and how they were experiencing advocacy at the international level. And then in summer 2018, um, before the referendum and after, I went home and did um, more of these interviews engaging with advocates. And it really was a very celebratory moment, but also um, something that in part surprised me, but I had seen it happen, and I'll talk about the referendum itself, was that there was some you know, human rights campaigns you have to look at successes and also analyze where things went wrong and you could see that some advocates there was some you know lingering um, pain around what had happened so the thing about referendums is that they're inherently you know nationalist projects it's like what kind of a country are we all coming together and voting on a big issue whether it's marriage equality divorce abortion and so for for that reason the actual campaign that emerged eight weeks prior to the referendum itself, so it was announced, and that's the time that the, the Together for Yes, which was the banner organization, um, mobilized and went into action, that they really felt that they had to have a colorful campaign about a bright emerging Ireland, building in part upon the work on marriage equality. You know, it was yes for love and equality for marriage equality, and this had to be yes were together for yes and it had to be bright and what happened with that mentality was that the campaign became about you're going to vote yes to be compassionate for the women in your life, your mother, your sister, your daughter, your cousin, your friend, your wife and that it was very much pitched at this kind of what kept being called the middle ground in Ireland. People still couldn't believe that opinion was changing even though polls kept saying that opinions had changed but they thought that the, there was this middle ground that needed to be shifted and this was the way to do it talk have a campaign about respectability foreground the respectable 
women who had only had an abortion because they had been given a diagnosis of a fatal fetal anomaly so it would be a woman and her couple they would have been foregrounded and again and it was also very much influenced by you know medics were finally coming on board and talking about the harms they were seeing in practice and this is really important you know we did need this information in the public domain um but you know when you i spoke to advocates after and i could see that there was a bit of a shift in the referendum campaign than to what had been the focus of the human rights advocacy all along so they said the human rights advocacy had been about documenting in particular you know the harms on marginalized women because these were the women who were being harmed the most by Ireland's abortion ban, who would struggle to get the money together and the time off and the childcare. Or, you know, if you were in going through an addiction program and leaving that, or if you were a migrant woman who couldn't travel, you know, particularly if you were in a detention center um, and how your access was completely impeded to getting abroad. But that was lost in the referendum campaign because the idea was that we, we can't talk about rights of marginalized people and capture the public in the same way as we can if we talk about compassionate health care at home this was the the broad narrative that was pushed and even though many of the claims you know you could say were quite similar obviously abortion is part of a woman's health care and right to health and um you know we, we should have empathy for our family members but as an advocate and as you know somebody who's thinking deeply about what you know a true rights-based feminist movement means um, you have to think about what happens when we change the narrative and leave out certain voices and a lot has been made again of the importance of women's stories in this campaign and that is really you know women's story should always should never be excluded but I think calling that as you know a strategy can be problematic in a way because you know there has to be another way for women to gain rights than um, to have to parade and tell their pain over and over again. And some people don't get to tell their stories. There was a a woman from um, the disabled from Yes group who said to me, you know, not not everybody made it to tell their story at this point. And also another advocate from the kind of socialist Rosa Women group kept saying you know they weren't in nobody was interested in my story my story was um i have a vicarious working contract and um i found myself pregnant couldn't afford it ordered the abortion pill online it went okay i'm happy to be on the other side but i shouldn't have had the threat of years in prison 14 years in prison for doing that but nobody wants to hear that nobody w wanted to hear her narrative so instead, we had a campaign that, at the end, um, lost its focus on rights, on human rights, and um, became a more of a humanitarian, paternalistic protection campaign. Um, but saying that, you know, that what women fought for and what is being celebrated now is much broader than that, and it really was seen as, you know, as we said, removing the shackles of this long history of burdening. Irish women in particular um, with the legacy of severe discrimination and um, we're open for questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I s just say one thing yeah. on the other because I, I, I had a little preview so I knew what you were coming to the end. I think that what you raised there at the end is, is very important and uh, I wrote a little dispatch on behalf of Human Rights Watch at the end of the marriage equality referendum and we have a you know from a human rights principles perspective, basic fundamental human rights should not be up for popularity concerts for people. And it's a problem with the Irish constitution when things are regulated, like divorce, which we now have, is regulated in the constitution, should be up to going around and asking the majority of people, and having that, you said, whether it was people uh, from the LGBT community who had to uh, either come out or talk about their stories, whether it was women who had to talk about some of the most difficult and painful times of their lives, it, it does become a, a popularity contest. And, and I you know, feel strongly that, um, in many ways, this it's a problem. The flip side, people will push back and say, yes, but in Ireland, and, and what neither of us actually touched upon was, 
in the lead up to this referendum, there was what we call a citizens' assembly, mm -hmm. where there was a big discussion, not just about this, but about key constitutional provisions. There was a recommendation from this kind of people public gallery that the, uh, uh, the ban on abortion should be removed from the uh, constitution. Um, and there was lots of debates in parliament where they took evidence from people. So there was a big debate about it. And people say, well, that's important for democracy. But at the end of the day, you know, women were being held hostage to what was going to be the most powerful argument as opposed to I am going to suffer because you decided I can't have my rights in the same way that someone's relationship wouldn't be protected because someone else made a decision about their rights. So I think that's a very fundamental problem, and we see it all over. You know, things being put up for the vote. Uh, some of the things were put up for the vote here in the midterm elections just uh, last week, and, and they happen all over um, all over the globe. So I do think this issue, what you said about, about things becoming a popularity contest and having to make decisions about, you know, which is the most... Um, <coughs> resonant it's not so i don't worry about which are the most resonant arguments that's important but it's the closing down of other arguments which are seen oh don't say that you'll put somebody off or that will you know turn people off and i think closing voices down in in that debate is 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 a problem when you put uh fundamental rights up for yeah for a popularity yes or nay uh, anyhow sorry i uh, let you <laughs> you will just open it up for questions yeah, uh, so the 8th Amendment was uh, appealed, but what's the law now, actually? So with all the conservative tradition, where does Ireland decide to rank on the spectrum on when to get an abortion and how to reconcile the rights of the, the unborn baby with the rights of the woman? Uh, I'll, 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 maybe we'll split it, because you may know more about the current debate. So the referendum, uh, what it did was it removed that thing I talked about respect. So the Constitution no longer uh, talks about the right to life of the unborn. It's gone. And what simply said is that provision may be made by law for the regulation of termination of pregnancy. So the Constitution now just says that the law should make provision for termina pregnancy terminations. So what's happening now is the debate about what that what will happen. It's clear from the legislation that was people were told before the uh, um, abortion, it won't just be these three grounds, you know, life-threatening, rape, fetal, fatal fetal abnormality. Uh, it'll be general access up to 24? 12. 12 weeks, up to 12 weeks. And then after that, there will also be access, but that will be then determined uh, on some medical grounds, and there are specific, specific grounds for that. That legislation has yet to pass. It's been debated. So at the moment, you can still only access an abortion if your life is in danger, because provision has not been made otherwise. Um, and then the big debate will come up is, the attempt to claw back that by um, creating a very wide um, conscientious objection um, clause. But you might know more about where it, it lies right at this moment. Um, at this moment, you know, it's at an amend the bill is at an amendment stage. So fortunately, there are a lot of strong politicians who did get the experience, as we said, in this, um, in having the committee there was a parliamentary committee discussing different options and a lot of particularly women politicians and you know you know ably assisted i guess by um prominent men they are pushing back at some of the things that were proposed so in before the referendum happened at the time conscientious objection wasn't included conscientious objection already exists in irish law so there wasn't a need to include it in the legislation you do have a situation now where the law the legislation requires a woman to go to her general practitioner to um get an abortion so the uh, model is hoping you know women will go within the first 12 weeks and get a medical abortion but it is requiring women to make two visits to the exact same doctor and have a three-day waiting period in between. So that raises a huge issue around conscientious objection um, and also access for a lot of women. So particularly if you're an asylum seeker, you only you don't have a big choice and array of doctors that you can go and see because you're in a detention centre. And the other issue is, is it can be quite expensive and forcing women to it's based on no public health evidence but in the campaign nobody was willing to challenge that because it was just let's keep going and we'll say you know we recognize it's a difficult decision and there's time for reflection but nobody was challenging that at the time 
And now we're seeing the repercussions of that of not talking about that um, prior to the referendum because it was completely unnecessary to put it there. Um, I am very optimistic that we will get legislation that looks quite good and not have a broader um, conscientious objection exception. So the problem would be if it say if the legislation said if you're conscientiously objecting that you do not have to refer to someone else um i think it it will be crazy if that goes through but i hope that it won't but um so i'm optimistic that the legislation will be um quite accessible but i mean there's there's still going to be waiting periods and um requiring doctors to prescribe rather than any other medical practitioner or um, allowing women to do what they were doing, which was ordering pills online. It kind of goes against a lot of the trends in the progressive countries now, which are focusing just on decriminalization and access. A physician even know how to abort? I mean, I couldn't really see that they... They've been taught how to abort a child. Yeah, that's the another USB. problem there. Well, there ha it hasn't been part of medical training, but yeah. there's... What's really encouraging is there is a group of you know women-led doctors who are saying we're going to start the training and we're going to bring people over. It's like the Star Doctors Group, um, which they got they formed right after the referendum. So that was very encouraging. But there there are provisions to be made, and at present, you know, one third of general practitioners say that they won't prescribe, which is also representative of you know an old you know, medicine is, you know, kind of conservative profession, which is another reason for why, you know, foregrounding medics in the campaign wasn't necessarily, um, you know, unless you're going to bring them all on board and it, you, you need to tackle those barriers too. Well, I, I, mean, so yeah. I do think the unanswered question on that, and you're absolutely right, I mean, since it's not being carried out, where do you begin skilling up and making sure that that's available? Um, and it'll certainly have to impact on medical training and new uh, healthcare professionals, you know, coming through. But for me, the concern is, I, I think under international human rights law, which I think the government will respect, you have an obligation to refer. If you will not carry out a service, you have an obligation to refer. What's less clear under international human rights law, and this is where Chile has gone, uh, Chile, yes, it is Chile, you allow an institution to say, we are a Catholic hospital and therefore we won't provide abortions. And the reality is that health services in Ireland are still very much regulated, even if nominally, by the Catholic Church. Find me a hospital that isn't a St. Vincent's, a St. Paul's, a St. Mary, uh, you know, it's all St. John's, exactly. Um, you know, so that's the concern that they're going to try to push from a board level to say we, don't, we won't provide it and there'll be so few places um, available. And on international law, um, it's less clear in terms of just an absolute prohibition on, on a, a conscientious objection extending to, to an institution. And in fact, what I was referring to in Chile, when they, they made gains in being able to liberalize abortion, and then they introduced a, a legislation which allowed conscientious objection. And the court, I believe, went so far to say that conscientious objection has to be extended to institutions. And so that is very problematic because it's one thing for an individual doctor or, or practitioner to say, I don't want to be involved and to extract themselves from a particular service, it's a different thing to do that. So I think that's uh, going to also be a, a risk. I don't know, you're falling a little bit closer on the ground, how big a risk that is, but it's certainly what we're seeing, um, the pushback, the clawback in other places where there's been similar liberalization. Um, it was a big issue on, in Argentina, and we also, as a human rights organization in Human Rights Watch, we were discussing how much do we push in Argentina because we knew a, a bill to liberalize uh, the almost complete criminalization of abortion in Argentina was on a knife edge. Now you might know just last month, I think it was, it was September, October, it failed. But one thing that had got into it, like you said, as legislation progressed, was a broad conscientious objection clause. Mm -hmm. And we we're like, do we start speaking against the conscientious objection clause and scupper the chance of some sort of liberalization, uh, which would give at least a lot of relief to, to many women uh, who otherwise wouldn't have access to, to this medical treatment at all. So I, that is the next battlefront uh, for me in general in Ireland and, and in other places where gains have been made over the last, um, and, and if you look at women's rights groups and particularly health groups, you can see them gearing up all their arguments and that and getting the doctors on board as to why that's, you know, what the problem of, of um, conscientious objection is. The very back there. Oh no! I mean, I had the same question, but perhaps just to, to um, 
take it one step further. I mean, of, of the 60, and it, I think it goes to your point uh, about the, you know, of the 66% that, that voted to repeal the Eighth Amendment, um, is there any research to say, well, of those 66%, do they all, do they support all forms of abortion um, at all stages? Um, or is it kind of just like, well, we, we can no longer have this as a, as a, uh, as a human rights issue, but there has to be some sort of compromise on the other side of the, of the coin, and I think you've got to the other side of the coin now, and that's where the debate, as you say, is, is going to take place. On the day of the referendum, they did a lot of polling um, at exit polls, and among yes voters, 84% um, of them said that they had voted based on a woman's right to choose. So not the exceptional cases, not the cases of rape, not the health or life of the woman, which was surprising to many that it was a, a campaign that succeeded in making this about choice. I mean, among the um, group, we'll say the percentage of people who had voted um, no, I mean, the vast majority there um, had said that their decision had been motivated um, in part because the um, law proposed was quite liberal, um, but also based on personal beliefs. So if one thing that I would say in campaigning around this is that the impact of human rights law, etc., and the impact of mobilisation, you're, you're, may, you may never get to the people who think that this is a fundamental part of their being and their religious identity. You might, but the real success story is thinking about how these norms are used to really mobilize other people who are either on the fence or who feel strongly enough about it but wouldn't have gone out to ensure. It was a landslide. I know it sounds like there's 33% who voted no, but that in a referendum, um, it was huge to get it that far. Thank you both for those presentations. My question is about the mobilisation piece about which you were speaking, which really reflected on you know, bringing the international human rights framework into the domestic context um, in Ireland. What was particularly striking watching the repeal the eighth and watching the marriage equality referendum as well is how many people came home to vote in this referendum. So can you talk a little bit about the strategy of mobilisation and human rights vis-a-vis -vis the diaspora and like, how that might... It's talk, talk us through that, it, how it looks compared to the domestic. Lasting couldn't fill <laughs> Well, look, yeah, let me put it So, so the, the, the rule on voting, if you're an Irish person abroad, you're not allowed to vote. I mean, there's no postal vote, there's no way. Um, I have been living outside the country <coughs> for more than two years, and you can explain the exception of that, uh, and I don't work for the diplomatic service, so I had lost my right to vote. And I, I tried to go back and argue that, you know, I still have a house in Ireland, I, it's my domicile even though I'm resident in the US and that I do not have a vote in the US and that, but I, I would have to lie under oath to get myself back onto the register, so um, I didn't. <laughs> um, and you know, there is a debate as to how many people who came home, um, in fact, maybe should not have been on the register and things like that, but I will agree, I'll let you then answer, but it is, there is now also talk, and particularly around the referendums, Oh, there's a reason Irish people aren't allowed to vote from abroad because there's so many of us who'd be entitled to you know basically you know ten to one people outside the country making decisions for people living in there. But there has been a debate about things like referendum that there should be an exception that it's different from voting in politicians and that because it's much more about fundamental values and, and direction of the country um, and and how we can uh, do that. But that was a huge moment, and I will say you know as a person who couldn't vote in that and and watching it, um, I was very emotional around the marriage equality, watching people vote. I totally didn't anticipate, um, and I, I was so much more emotional around the um, abortion referendum. I may literally kind of spent uh, Friday when the vote was, and Saturday when it was becoming clear, in tears. I mean, of joy, but I didn't realize just how many years of, you know, what I had suppressed through all the time, and just watching people go home and vote, watching people come out, realizing that like two thirds of Irish people were going to finally say yes. And I do think that's important. You asked about the 66%. At least on the exit polls, most of them said it was about a choice thing, which I would have found surprising as well. But it was clear from the beginning, no, this is not a narrow, it's going to be general access, even if it's for a short period, but it's going to... So, um, yeah, the diaspora, but it's a limited way you can... Or like, but you were able to go back. I was able to go back. And one thing I will say is that um, 
there were diaspora groups formed in cities all around the world um, launching they were there was the London Irish abortion rights campaign which was huge and a key thing that they did was they fundraised to get people home and they were really energetic and kind of innovative about it so for a lot of students who a lot of Irish students go to university in the UK um, so they started encouraging people in their institutions to lobby the student unions to help them pay for flights home. There also became um, people could donate to fund people's um, trips home. But these organisations had been, they were, you know, the London Irish Rights um, Campaign in Brussels, um, Australia, Vancouver, New York. They had really mobilised already, so between having solidarity marches, campaigning at the Irish Embassy, campaigning the embassies there to put pressure on the Irish government. They had done a phenomenal amount of work and it was amazing to come home to vote and to... Um, a big part of the one part of the campaign that was quite visible were um, these repeal jumpers that were these black jumpers and said repeal across. You could have seen me wearing it in the in the law school, <laughs> and people flew home with these um, jumpers. And you would be in the airport, and there were celebrations welcoming people to come home. And it was, um, you know, so many people had gone abroad. You know, they were living abroad in you know to progress their careers, etc., with the idea of wanting to come home to a nation that respected their right to equality in um, Irish society. So it was, I think it was very heartening for a lot of people and, you know, it was huge for me. Um, I wasn't sure how my mom was going to vote, um, but she did help me pay for my flights home. So, you know, it was getting, it was an indication all the time that she was, she was getting there and it was huge for people to like arrive at the airport and to be greeted by um you know older people saying oh well fair play to you for coming home etc and everybody then got to really celebrate at home with their families in what we feel like is a is a new ireland one last question sure i actually wanted to ask about the next steps for the new ireland <laughs> and in particular um we have real issues here of course with our restrictive state um, laws in different states um, that really put it to poor women who don't have access. Is there ongoing work now of these groups switching from a repeal um, organization to some sort of economic support organization? Well, there is a public health system in Ireland which will mitigate many of the costs for women and it's supposed to be free and a big thing now is trying to work out how it can be free for women in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the repeal campaigners, mm -hmm. they're now folk. So abortion is still illegal other than the exceptions in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the focus is on um, advocating in Northern Ireland, but also in the meantime, how if we're gonna have liberal laws down here in the South, how do we incorporate the, the women in the North so that they will be able to access um, abortion because even though even just the past year it became free for women to travel to the UK mm -hmm. free in terms of the procedure not in terms of all their travel costs and going to the NHS um, but that was only in the past year so it would be in terms of access for women in the North it would be a lot easier if they could you know drive across the border mm -hmm. and get access but that hasn't that's they're trying to do that now and the health minister has said that he wants to try and do that but they're looking at mechanisms to do so. Um, any movement to um, help make up lost wages for women who have to do that three-day wait um, and go to multiple visits? I mean, for, for women on the margins that would be a huge barrier still. It's not a huge part of the, the discussion mm. um, and the lost wages thing isn't may not be as dramatic as it can be for us. So here in North Carolina, you know, women who have to come to Durham, which is huge, or women from South Carolina come to Durham, and they do have to take time off. So Ireland's smaller, so, you know, if you can, if you do encounter, you know, your conservative male general practitioner, um, hopefully you can get to another one not as far away. Um, but the three-day waiting period makes absolutely no sense. Um, yeah. well, one hopes and suspects now that it's in legislation that once it gets in, when it becomes clear that this is just a, 
a barrier which has actually no medical or, or other value that it can be repealed uh, within it. And I just, not to the one thing, but back in 2010, um, Human Rights Watch and I about, put out a report on, on a state of isolation. And it's what you said, like these women feeling abandoned at one of the most difficult times. But it tried to focus as well on, on women um, who weren't able to travel as well and, and for financial. And in 2010, of course, it was just almost at the peak of the pain following the 2008 crash, and, and we won't call it a recession, but, but the austerity measures. So I think there was a lot of awareness at that time. And again, I, I don't think people thought they might see abortion happen because the government refused to talk to us when we were doing the support. But there was very much awareness at that time of, because of austerity, as you say, Christine, um, of the burdens. And so I think that's not, it's, it won't be a new issue for, for people. I don't think it's the top, um, I don't think we're seeing yet kind of very deliberate steps, um, but it's been one that's been on the agenda. So I, I wouldn't, I'd be surprised if it fell away once it becomes clear what the service is, where it is, if it then be it'll become analyzed in terms of are there marginalized women um, who are going to still bear the brunt of, of, of access. Um, and I'm noticing one, there was one horrible case, which we didn't mention, was a woman who was a refugee uh, who had been raped in her home country. Um, and when she got to Ireland, um, she discovered she was, she was pregnant, she was suicidal. She was not able to go to the UK to travel to get an abortion. And then, even though this is after Civitan, we had a, a, a legislation which was supposed to allow her access uh, in cases where she was suicidal, she was forced to go through with that pregnancy. She went on hunger strike. She was not force fed, but force hydrated. And they performed uh, a forced cesarean on her uh, for, for the child. So. You know, those cases, that happened, one would hope it would never happen again. But again, there are going to be marginalized women, there are going to be difficult cases like that, and, and I think we're not, um, you know, we, we have to be prepared prepared for them and make sure that uh, uh, the law doesn't, again, entangle uh, service providers and not to, to trap women like that again. Thank you all so much for being here, and please thank, uh, join me in thanking our speakers.